Okay, once again, welcome to Fair Use in the Classroom. My name is Jennifer Kelly, uh, Copyright Liaison, um, Faculty Librarian, Professional Development Coordinator. Uh, today we are talking about Fair Use. What I'd like to begin with is just a quick assessment of what you know about Fair Use or what questions you have about Fair Use. So I'm going to throw a blank whiteboard up here and have you using either the pencil marker at the top of your screen. That's going to be, I don't know if you can see, oh, let me grab my pointer here. Okay, so right up at the top there, use the pencil, you can write, um, usually badly, <laughs> um, or use the text, which would probably make some more sense, to type in what you know about fair use or what questions you have about fair use. So. When I say fair use, what comes to mind? I'll give you guys a second to type things in. Thank you. Um, free to use any way I want in educational contexts. All right, what else? I know it's important, but does anybody really get caught? Good question. Any other thoughts? All right, this is a good place to start. And if you have any questions as, ooh, how much is fair to use? A very good question, excellent. Um, and you can feel free to keep asking questions in the little uh, chat box. Again, if it's, your panel isn't open yet, it's going to be in the bottom right-hand corner, little purple area, click on that and it will open up your Collaborate panel so you can communicate during the session. Um, feel free at the bottom of your screen, there's a little, um, guy, little silhouette of a person raising their hand, use that to raise your hand if you'd like, or just type things in. I'll be looking at the chats throughout and it's easy for me to um, get that idea, get an idea of what you guys are talking about from me, from that. Um, I just changed this over so there's little silhouettes. I'm going to switch back to my slideshow here. All right, so fair use in the classroom, let's move along here. A brief review of some of the things we talked about um, in the last session, which is an introduction to copyright in the classroom, um, just reviewing what copyright is and what it means. So copyright owners uh, have exclusive rights to their works, um, five things that they can do with their work that you cannot unless you have permission. So they can make copies of their work, distribute the work, create derivative copies of the work, display the work publicly, and perform the work publicly. You cannot do any of those things unless you have permission or if it, you can determine that the use of this work is fair. We're gonna talk a little bit about what that means. But knowing that fair use is flexible Fair use is also very complicated. Um, we'll get to the complex stuff in a little bit, um, but it is the biggest limit on copyright um, protections. So this gives users a lot of leeway with copyright protected works. Um, even if you ask for permission for something and a copyright owner says no, fair use still can apply. So it's not anything that a copyright owner has control over. Um, but um, again, this comes back to, we'll get to this when we talk about how complicated it is. Um, there are no bright lines for fair use and fair use is something that can only be determined if it goes to court, okay? so. It's a little bit of a leap of faith to argue fair use. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But let's talk first about the primary uses, um, the, well, the specific uses that, um, that are considered fair. Oh, that looks goofy. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. So this is a, bad translation of picture from Google Slides to uh, PowerPoint, but commentary and criticism. So um, think about 
the use of copyrighted work for the purposes of commentary. Um, a movie comes out and someone is reviewing that movie on YouTube, on TV, in a newspaper. They use a clip of the film or a still from the film. That's considered fair use, commentary and criticism. Um, you don't have to be a professional to do this. It can be on a blog. It can be um, for other purposes as well. So you can use um, some material for this purpose, commentary and criticism. Another one that's very well known is the use of, of copyright protected works for satire and parody. So some famous examples might be one that's cited a lot in, in legal discussions is the, um, I can remember the name of it, Campbell versus Acuff Rose music. So this was 1994, uh, dating myself. Two Live Crew um, released a song called Pretty Woman that used the first line of the song, Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison. Um, and it was determined that this was fair use because it was it was making fun of the song. It was a it was a parody. It was satire of that. So to hear, you know, "Goodnight Democracy," clearly satire, uh, making fun of of the tropes in "Goodnight Moon." News reporting very frequently. You again like commentary and criticism, you will see excerpts of copyrighted works used to report news, um, and that's considered a fair use. And finally, one of the uses that is most relevant to our discussion today is teaching and research. So using copyrighted works without permission, without licensing, without payment for the purposes of teaching and research. It seems very straightforward, right? So we could do it for all these four things. Um, and as long as you are, say, teaching or you are um, doing a parody or any of these other things, you're free to use that material, right? This is where the complications of fair use come in. So fair use has several things to consider. There's four primary factors, and we're going to talk about those in a moment, um, and five if you consider sort of this overarching idea um, of transformative use. So thinking back to those uses that I talked about, commentary and criticism, satire and parody, news reporting, teaching and research, the thing that all four of those uses has in common is that it is transforming the use of the original copyrighted words. So for example, Goodnight Moon was not designed to be a commentary on democracy. <laughs> um, if I were talking about it and critiquing the book, um, that's not the purpose of the book. It was designed as a children's book to be read by children, um, to be read to children, etc. So by commenta commenting on it, using it in a scholarly work, or discussing it in a classroom, or reporting on its sales figures and showing a picture of the image, all of those are not the primary intended purpose of that work. And so by using it in this manner, by making it the topic of my classroom discussion or my entire course, I have transformed the use. The four main ideas behind fair use, in addition to this transformative idea, um, these are the, the four fair use factors that need to be considered whenever you're making a fair use evaluation. Briefly, the purpose of the work, the nature of the work, the effect of your use on the market, and the amount of use. And what I need to stress here is that this is the complicated part. Um, in this chart, they're all represented as equal, but it's really a balancing act. So 
you could have three factors weighing against fair use and still be able to call it fair use because of one of the other factors. So it's the evaluation process is complicated and um, and involves more than just a simple yes or no. So let's talk a little bit about these four factors and how you'd be using them in a an evaluation of of whether something is fair use. So our first consideration is the purpose and character of the use. This is the one that's looking at the actual, like your intention, rather than, than other parts of this. So what are you going to be doing with it? As we said, those, those four uses, education, research, news reporting, criticism, and commentary, all favor for fair use. So if you are using an image, we'll use an image as our our example here, you're using a copyright protected image for any of these purposes, this weighs in favor of fair use. If you're using it for nonprofit purpose, that's another you know, check mark in your column for favoring for fair use. Commercial for-profit purposes favor against fair use. So you have an image and you want to use it um, in your classroom that favors fair use. If you have an image and you want to use it in a book that you're publishing, even though that might count as scholarship or research, it does not necessarily favor fair use. Not to say that you can't use it, because again, this is only one of, of four factors and um, there's many other things that come into play. Any questions about that idea? Uh, this might be one of the easiest ones in the classroom because we are um, educational uses are always favoring fair use. If we were a for-profit college, it becomes very complicated, right? Because it's education, but it's commercial and for-profit. So I'm not sure how they, they balance that, and I'm glad we don't have to worry about it. The next factor is the nature of the original work. So keeping in mind that copyright does not protect fact and facts and data, fair use favors factual works. So works of nonfiction, um, works of fact, and I saw the question pop up and I'll get to that in a second. Um, works of fact as opposed to highly creative works. So a nonfiction book or an essay, use of that would um, be considered fair use, way in favor of fair use. A opera or a image or a novel um, would not favor fair use. Published works that favors fair use. If it's an unpublished work, um, that counts a little bit against fair use. And let me go back to the question here. Um, what if I'm not making money on the book if it's published open? Um, that's a really good question. So that could favor fair use. But again, we're to, we're to also need to consider all of the other um, parts of this. So um, what is it that you're using? So you're not making money, you're publishing something open. Is that, um, are you using something that's published or are you using something that's not published? Um, if we look at our next consideration, um, what's the amount of the thing that you're using? It's really important to consider as well. So OER might on its face lean towards Yes, that's, well, no, it's a good question. <laughs> it would be odd to not use openly licensed stuff in an open book. I think that there's some conflict there, obviously, um, but it, it would be possible, absolutely. Um, but you again, you probably have to negotiate some licensing in there if it doesn't count towards fair use. Uh, so our next factor is amount and sub substantiality. So amount, straightforward, is it a lot of the work or is it part of the work? 
Um, substantiability gets to this idea um, that's used a lot in discussing fair use is the heart of the work. So if we think of a movie and we are presenting a commentary on the film, are you going to show the key pivotal scene of the movie as part of your uh, criticism that's going to air on TV? That would be considered um, not favoring fair use. Whereas showing some scenes here and there, um, little peripheral, exactly, spoilers. Um, if it's a spoiler, um, you could probably consider it the heart of the work, right? This is, if it's a, you know, something research related, then it would be sort of the conclusion you know, or the, you know, the, the meat of it, but sharing maybe just the abstract or the introduction um, might, might favor fair use. So peripheral components versus the heart of the work, a smaller amount versus larger amounts. Um, and this is real, where it's important to stress that there's, there's no bright lines here. You'll see classroom guidelines for use where they say 10% or X number of pages. Those are, those were recommendations made by the publishing companies and they're not actually um, law. So it's a judgment call in many cases. Um, you're f absolutely free to use those guidelines and say, I will only use, you know, 10% of this if it's a you know, a hundred chapter book, you, you use a whole chapter. Um, but also know that that's not necessarily going to put you in the clear just by following those guidelines because there are no um, strict rules, um, legally speaking, when it comes to amount. Um, the effect on the market. Does it favor fair use? Um, can you access this same thing easily by paying for it? And is it is that price prohibitive? Is this made easily available through a license, even a Creative Commons license? Um, is this something that would be really hard to license for your purposes. Um, this has implications for the classroom when we talk about using, for example, the same article over and over in a class. The idea is that an article comes out in, say, a newspaper. It's very timely. It's perfect. You found it while you were reading the newspaper and drinking your coffee in the morning say oh this is going to work perfectly for what i want to talk about talk about in my class so you make copies distribute them to your students you know for the whole week um, all the sections of your class you talk about it it's great it works out really well um, you want to incorporate it, it incorporate it into your curriculum if you want to use it over and over again the idea is that if there is a mechanism for you to get this license it, pay the use, pay the copyright owner for it, then there's an expectation that you do that for subsequent uses, especially if it's an easy thing to do. If it's just a matter of, you know, writing a quick email, can I use this in my class? Um, if it's something that has licensing information right on it, um, if it's clear who's publishing it, um, if you know that you can ask the library to take care of that for you, then there's this expectation that you will use that mechanism as opposed to using it at the spur of the moment where it would be burdensome for you to ask for permission because it's timely and relevant. So that would, that, that's another way of balancing that fair use. Um, the tr idea of something being transformative um, is sort of, again, that sort of overarching idea that we go back to again and again in um, discussing fair use. So a couple of the questions that can be raised, and I'm looking at um, a legal encyclopedia right now, 
and um, has the material that was taken from the original work been transformed by adding a new expression or new meaning to it? Or has it just been taken wholesale and applied to this new work? Um, and was there value added to the original by creating new information, new aesthetics, new insights, and understandings? This is the idea of copyright and the idea of the commons and why fair use exists. Right? So the idea of copyright is to protect the creator's interests for as long as, in theory, as long as it takes um, for those new ideas to impact the market and to impact our way of thinking. They are copyright was designed around the idea that the information you are creating, the work that you are creating is contributing to the commons. And when we read a book, watch a movie, enjoy a piece of artwork, um, listen to music, we can then take the inspiration from those and apply them to new works, which will also join the commons, right? So this idea of transformation is adding value to something that somebody created. So someone went through the trouble to create some art and that art has inspired new art um, or has inspired new ideas or new understandings, right? So um, our first example is uh, the famous uh, Annie Leibovitz photograph of a pregnant Demi Moore um, from Vanity Fair. And next to that is the parody poster from the Naked Gun 33 and a third movie. Um, this was uh, 1998. This was a lawsuit, um, Leibovitz versus Paramount Pictures Corporation. And in this case, the movie poster was determined to be fair use. Um, it's a parody of the Vanity Fair image, um, and it's transformative because because of that parody. Because we're supposed we're now laughing at this. We're now thinking, okay, that's actually pretty ridiculous. Um, here's a new way of looking at it, um, and you know maybe we don't call it a new contribution to the world of art, but it's it's a conversation with the original. The second example is um, the author mimicking the style of a Dr. Seuss in order to create a work that is commenting on the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, this was 1997, Dr. Seuss Enterprises versus Penguin Books. This was not considered transformative, and it's hard to see just because we have the cover here, so we're not judging. Um, we're not really, this isn't an apple, this is kind of apples and oranges uh, because it's not just the the cover art, it's the entire book, which I don't have for you to see. And the book's not available right now because it was um, deemed infringing. So the book itself was not a parody of Cat in the Hat. Instead, it was adopting the manner and presentation of a Dr. Seuss book in order to tell a different story. So it's not satire of Dr. Seuss, it's mimicking Dr. Seuss in order to communicate something new. So it's not transformative, it's not adding to the conversation, it's stealing somebody else's style for a completely new and different purpose. Does that make sense? So um, there's lots of different examples um, that you can find if you're you're interested in seeing sort of what counts as transformative and what doesn't count as transformative. I'm going to share a, a link here. This is the um, the NOLO uh, legal encyclopedia talking about fair use and and what counts as transformative. Um, I think it's interesting. Some people, you might see some things on there that you recognize, like the Harry Potter Encyclopedia, if you remember that. Um, that was deemed not transformative. Um, some other uses that, you know, it 
seeing more examples might clarify what counts as transformative and what um, might not be. Before I go on, do I, um, are there any questions? I want to make sure that I I cover what what types of things you are hoping to learn about. I'll give everybody a moment. If you want to type something in or if you want to use the microphone, feel free to do that. Yes, so Gone with the Wind parody, Wind Dung Gone, and that was another one that um, that went to the courts. And let me see if I can find that one. And it was really contentious. The um, estate of, I'm going to forget her name, um, Margaret Mitchell was was really, really aggressive in their their pursuit of um, Alice Randall, who's the author of The Wind Done Gone. Um, let's see, it was determined. Oh, what? It was settled. Yeah, so that one was settled out of court. Yes, author won, but the publisher had to make a donation to college. Absolutely, yep. Um, and it does say that it's a parody, and I have a feeling, I mean, that that's what it comes down to. Yes, the sticker on the front of the book. Thank you. Um, and that, that, I think that was a really, and again, another really well-known case of, of fair use. Um, let's see. So going back, I'm curious about what questions you get asked most often. Most often it is about images. Can I use this image? And usually in something like, can I use it as the um, header image in my Blackboard course? The, I think those are the most, that's what I get the most. Um, and things like, can I use this image in my PowerPoint? Can I use my Im this image on my website? Um, images, lots of images questions. Um, the easiest way to uh, around the image question is to use images that are Creative Commons licensed or in the public domain. Otherwise, um, I would say, um, what else? Generally, since most of the questions are based in the classroom, then that does count as fair use. Um, if you're, you can put any image you want in a PowerPoint if you're showing it in your class. Um, and you should always cite it, um, although citing it doesn't preclude a copyright violation. That's a very good question, though. <laughs> um, so YouTube videos seems to be an assumption that if it's on YouTube, you can use it in class. Yes, you can use it in class. Absolutely. Um, that, again, does not mean. So let's talk about. So, for example, an entire movie is uploaded to YouTube. Um, I found a TV series that's not available yet. It's a BBC show and it happened to be entirely available on YouTube. Um, they had done some weird thing to it that made it it's the uh i know i'll tell you about it afterwards um it's the robert gilbraith adaptation of those uh the striker cormoran striker um cormoran strike novels anyway they're available um and uploaded illegally clearly and you could absolutely have your students watch those and send them the link to it or play it in class the problem is is that youtube will is likely going to find them and take them down. So I think that's the bigger issue pedagogically. Um, I would not embed these into a course. Um, if it were an entire book that you found that was uploaded and it doesn't look like it was uploaded by the publisher and it's not licensed as open, I would not download that book and share it with your class. Um, one of the important aspects of copyright is, especially with educational uses, is is the copy that you're using legally obtained. So um, that's that's something you want to think about as far as use. But pointing to something is never a copyright violation. It'd be like giving it giving someone an address. So um, providing a link to an article in libraries databases, providing a link to a YouTube video, providing a link to a PDF. 
um, is is always your best way around it. Um, another thing that actually came up, and this was um, through with conversation I've had with Jen Butler, um, and Jen, I don't know if you want to tell the the story or how you've resolved it, <laughs> but um, we're talking about again images and what kind of images you can use to promote a video um, showing a movie like a film showing and uh, things that might be available publicly um, versus things that are not well the, it's, it was a complicated thing and it's as fair use always is and it comes down to um, balancing this balancing act and determining okay so I want to use an image to promote um, you found a way around it. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay. <laughs> so say, you know, this is a, a similar situation. Um, let's kind of generalize. So you want to, there's, you're having a, let's say a book discussion, the COD page turners, and they want to have images on their poster, um, an image of the book, an image of the author, or something along those lines, something from the author's website. So things to think about. Let me um, switch over here to, what time is it? We've got some time here. I'm going to make sure I also answer your, make sure I get all of your questions. Let's get a whiteboard here. So here are some things. So um, we want to put images on a flyer for COD book club. Okay. Um, what are some things that we want to think about? So this is, it's for COD club. That's something that we know. Um, what else do we know about it? It's free. It's an image that is available on the author's public site. What other things might we want to think about? Uh, participants will likely purchase the book. OK. What other questions might we want to ask or think about? Or given these characteristics, which are most important or which are not important at all? Uh, if you're going to do it only once, does that matter? Um, and are we just taking the book jacket? These are good questions. So let's say we are making a one-time flyer that will go up around COD, only in print. We're not going to put it on the web. And we are going to take a picture of the book jacket. Yeah, we're just going to copy that right off of um, Google Images. All right, so we've got some comments here. Um, talking book jacket, we use it once, does it matter? Uh, we have a guest, say, guest saying, geez, saying fair use. Um, it took a picture that looked like the one girl that was on a free site, made it black and white. Excellent. That's very good. So you just used a different image. That's perfect. So in this case, does it matter that it's a COD club? So we're thinking um, this is purpose, it's education, commentary. That might count. That might weigh in favor of fair use, right? So we're not um, we're not charging for this. We're not making money off of the poster. Um, so it's not commercial, it's education related. Um, it's only in print, correct? We're not making it available online. Um, it's just gonna be flyers tacked up around campus. Uh, the nature of the original work. So it's a book cover. It has some artistic components to it. What do you think? Does that make a difference? So we have, it has like a pretty design and uh, an original drawing. Does that favor or not favor? Fair use, not favor, yep. If it were just type, does the publisher own that too? Yep, absolutely. Yep, publisher would own that. 
Um, so in theory, without fair use, we would have to ask permission from the publisher if we're going to use this. So that's the nature. We've got characteristic and nature, amount and substantiality, excuse me. Um, what if we make, so the book is a standard hard, hardcover, right? So we'll just pretend that's eight and a half by 11. <laughs> um, it's a very big book, uh, eight and a half by 11. And we are just using a, a thumbnail size of it to go on our flyer. So it won't take up the whole thing. Does that favor or not favor? I would totally use it. <laughs> favor, yep. Yeah, so thumbnail um, favors fair use, which is why when you go to Google, you will see little thumbnail images and that is considered fair use because I um, that was an issue that Google was having um, using copyright protected works um, in their search. So yes, having small, a small and low resolution is another th that would favor fair use. And the effect on the market. Does a small thumbnail picture of the book jacket impact the market negatively? We said that this might encourage people to buy the book. I'm going to say that it doesn't. Um, yeah, so this is a um, a, posit a positive impact on the market, perhaps. Um, consider it free advertising for the author, maybe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and so usually when we think of the effect on the market, we're thinking of a negative effect. Um, but in this case, we might be able to think it um, the thumbnail solution. Absolutely, yeah. And that's one of those things that definitely that can have like a really, um, it's a simple way to to kind of shift the balance when you're weighing out these these different um, factors. So um, you want to use an image, especially with an image, um, make it small, make it low resolution. If your entire use of it is just sort of like something to catch somebody's attention or some, but something to promote this thing, that's usually a good way to do it when you're balancing those, those aspects. OK. Um, there are some phenomenal um, resources out there that can help you do this balancing act. Let me sh show you, let's get back to the presentation here. All right, the Fair Use Evaluator. I'm gonna give you the URL here. And this is the tool that I use um, occasionally for, uh, it's, it's a nice, it, it illustrates fair use well because it asks you good questions. And also at the end of it, it gives you a PDF that you can hold on to because again, um, you, you never know if something is fair use until you are sued and the courts favor your argument, um, unfortunately. It's the only way to determine fair use. So you're always making a fair use argument. And if you go through the process of evaluating your use and keeping a record of that, that, well, it's, it's just a recommended practice um, to do that with your analysis. So I think an earlier question here was, has anyone ever been caught? Um, it's, yes, they have, <laughs> um, it's usually, it's usually commercial when that happens. Um, I worked for, um, a website where teachers can share their educational materials as uh, their, I was their uh, copyright person for a little while there. And I did a lot of takedowns for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act um, based on exactly this sort of thing. Like, can I use, can, can I use this copyrighted thing on my website? The copyright owner 
would contact me and say they don't have my permission to use this, they can't do this, so I would have to contact the person and say, you know, you can't use this in your work. Um, and sometimes it was black and white, sometimes it was not. Um, it is always a really good idea just to keep track of these things. And sometimes you can just negotiate something with the copyright owner. Uh, but showing good faith, showing that you, you've thought about this is important. Um, another thing that I use is a really simple, let me see if I can find it, it should be on the college's on the library's copyright page, which I will give to you in just a moment here, um, is a simple form that I use to share whenever anyone has a question for me about fair use. Um, let me point you to, this is the copyright tools page. And one of the things that's on here that's fun is the um, public domain slider. Uh, we'll talk about that um, in our next webinar. Um, and the Fair Use Evaluator is on here. And it does not have my form, but it is basically the Columbia University um, Fair Use Checklist. Let's see. Sorry, I don't have this right at hand. Does anybody have any additional questions? Here we go. Let me give you the link here to this checklist. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward and easy to use. There we go. Um, using it, they recommend using it as a roadmap to sort of guide you um, to help you kind of understand the process and make your best determination. But remembering that it's uh, it is complicated. And, there, and then there's no single answer. Will you help faculty get permission? Yes, absolutely. Um, I personally don't go through that process, um, but that, that's handled through uh, circulation, I believe. But I will point them in the right directions. Um, and also on the copyright guide, we have information for faculty um, how to just write a letter asking for permission. And I think it seems like it would be really daunting, but it's it's actually not. It's, I mean, it might be daunting if you're trying to go through like this major publisher of, you know, really well-known writers and academics, but generally if it's just, oh, I saw your article, can I use it? It's just a conversation between two people. Um, do, do I know if the college spends money on copyright permissions? I don't know. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> Lots of pops. Um, yes, the bookstore probably does do this for course backs. Absolutely. Um, start with, it's a good question. It depends on the, on the work. Um, if it's clear who owns the copyright, like copyright, um, symbol and a date and the copyright owner, start with them. Um, otherwise, start with the name on there and the author if they don't own the copyright will tell you who does own the copyright yes karen you came in a little bit late and um guest is actually denise she's undercover <laughs> so these are all really good questions <laughs> we're all friends here all right so that pretty much wraps up the content um, we have two more workshops coming up creative commons in the public domain which is going to be a lot of fun yeah the evaluator um, source is good ala is awesome at that stuff uh, so we've got creative commons coming up in on the 15th and then um, beginning of april copyright basics for online teaching so happy to answer any additional questions um, you can always contact me, of course. You are so welcome. It's my email address, even though I know you have it already. There you go. So thank you very much. And um, I really appreciate your questions and your engagement with the topic and the conversations that we had. You guys had some really good questions. Yay. All right, thanks guys. <laughs>